Hello and welcome back to Pictorial on Relay FM. I'm Quinn Rose and I didn't go to art school, but I still love learning about art and hearing all about it from my co-host. Hi, and I'm Betty. I also didn't go to art school, but I obviously also love learning about art. I actually learned a lot this week. Most of it are stuff that I didn't know before, so I'm very excited to talk about it. Today is the very last day of our little mini-series on religious art traditions, and I am so excited to hear all about Hindu art. Like we talked about last episode, we kind of inadvertently, or, you know, didn't plan it, but like uh, uh, went back in time in terms of like the old, going from, I guess, the newest religion uh, to the oldest or one of the oldest most likely the Otis. I'll talk about that in a second, which is Hinduism. And it is a religion that, you know, I obviously have heard of, but just don't know very much about. Um, So it was, yeah, it was very exciting to kind of learn an overview about Hinduism and then look at some of the artworks that have been created over the thousands of years (laughs) that it's been around. So the interesting thing about Uh, Hinduism um, is that unlike some of the other religions we talked about, like Christianity or Islam, like as far as we know, there's no known like single founder, no like spokesperson or prophet. Um, So like its origins are of, of like a mixture of origins, basically, and it's quite complex. And as I mentioned before, it is really old. So according to historians and archaeologists, um, it's believed that it probably originated as far back as the third to second millennium BCE during the Indus Valley civilization. So that's like 5,000 years ago. So that's the earliest sources that they can find of Hindu traditions. Um, So although it didn't really become like a dominant religion in Southeast Asia until uh, like around the fourth century CE, I didn't even know it was that old. It is really funny how we keep going back in time with these because I remember talking in the Islamic art episode and being like, this stuff is so old. (laughs) And like, we've gone back literally thousands of years from that point to here. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm American. Everything seems (laughs) so old to me. I know. It's it's so funny. Yeah, we like in even in the Christianity episode, I was like, oh, this is from the Roman catacombs from the year 200. It is like so long ago, like, you know, it is a long time ago. But this is like, more than double the (laughs) oldness of Christianity. Like I said before, like it's has a mixture of different influences. Um, And so like one of the things about Hinduism is also that it's not, I guess it's not like as strict in terms of it's like dogma and traditions like it actually accepts a lot of traditions from other cultures and other religions and it like isn't so much like it isn't so much like stringent on it has to follow like a certain set of rules there obviously are certain traditions and certain rituals um which we'll talk about in a little bit um but one of the things is that it shares a lot of similar characteristics as buddhism and apparently both of these religions go back to the foundational texts which are the vedas and the upanishads the like Hinduism differs from Buddhism in a lot of way, different ways, and I'm, we don't have time to get into that right now. But one of the major differences is that Hinduism follows a caste system, whereas Buddhism doesn't. That like that's not the only difference, but it's it's probably one that most people have heard of. So I had thought that unlike the other religions we talked about, that Hinduism is polytheistic, which means that there's not just one god but apparently this is not technically true but i i welcome anyone who knows more about hinduism to correct me uh, because what i've read is that there actually is one true god in hinduism called brahman um, but brahman can manifest itself in different forms so i guess he can transform into other gods like he can even transform like genders and like all kinds of uh, i guess like abilities and different things so it's more like 
there is one God, but people pray to all these different gods because the one God transforms into all these other ones. That is the way I understand it. Oh, I feel like that's a really cool kind of system because I feel like that's, um, I mean, as we talked about before, like my major religious framework is Christianity. And I feel like that's the function of saints in Christianity where you have like, they're not gods, but they're like specific holy figures for like specific causes. And they're like the agents of the you know, capital G God. <laughs> and so it, it feels like a similar framework, but instead of being like, oh, like these are these are saints who are just like dead people. Um, it's like, oh, it's the one God who is transforming for different purposes. Yeah, it is kind of like that, although it is probably similar to like the Trinity, how there's like the Father and Son and Holy Ghost, but they're like one entity is what most Christians believe. So in Hinduism, it's kind of like that because there is also a Trinity system, um, which I think is Shiva, Vishnu, and Brahma. Like they are like one, they're, they're different gods, but they, they're, they're, they transform into each other. So I, I think it's more like that. They're on equal levels, uh, as each other, although there are like lesser gods in Hinduism as well, which we won't have time to talk about all of them. I'm probably just going to cover some of the major ones there. So there are about 1 billion people who, um, are Hindus in the world. Um, but eight, uh, it is also 80% of India's population. And, um, but Obviously, there's um, other countries in Southeast Asia that have also have a lot of people that practice uh, Hinduism, but probably a lot of the examples I'll be talking about today are from India. And what I want to start with are Hindu temples, because they are similar to what we talked about before, um, like mosques and synagogues and churches and um, places of worship. Like there's just... It's a significant part of Hinduism, um, and the like architecture and the sculptures quite often in these temples are like morphing into each other. Like it's a very interconnected system. There's there again. There's so many Hindu temples, and I'm gonna just talk about one today because it's one of the coolest places that I have ever seen. Ooh. I'm going to so before I sorry before I talk about this temple the like an overview of Hindu temples is that the scu- the sculptures they're not just like decoration and adornment they're like an important part of the temple's meaning and an important part of like the um people's like worship um and then they're f- like frequently like really organic in terms of design and basically every temple is dedicated to one of the gods. So there will be a temple dedicated to Shiva. There will be a temple dedicated to Vishnu. Um, so I just sent you a link to this temple. So it's called the uh, Kalasa Temple at Ellora, and it is located in India. So it's in the state of Maharashtra and in the district of Urangubad. i hope I pronounced that correctly because I looked up and there were a few different pronunciations. Um, but anyway, it's a temple that, from what I read, carved out of a the side of a cliff and it's carved out of a single piece of rock. Whoa. Like it's not like a built like masonry. It's not like people are putting, building stones like on top of each other. It's like it's carved out. Um, so it's kind of like the negative space of this temple is what was worked on i guess <laughs> that is so cool how do you even do that exactly i i have no idea or i mean there, there are, sorry there are i'm not going to talk too much about like the construction and the building of the temple because that's uh, like a lot of information we could spend this whole episode just talking about this one temple um but uh it was built in uh around 757 to 783 ce so this is a like almost 1300 years ago. So this one is dedicated to the god Shiva and it was commissioned by King Krishna the 1st who reigned the Rashtrakuta dynasty at the time. Like it's a way for the king to like show devotion to the god Shiva and then subsequently the worshipers would come to this temple. And I believe people still come to this temple. Um it, like it's it's 
a, like a major destination for Hindus. And but it's also a UNESCO World Heritage site, so I presume there may be some tourism as well. I mean, it looks so cool that it, like I if I ever go to India, I want to see this. Yeah, this is gorgeous. So is this a common way that temples are built or is this one unique? As far as I know, like it's not unique as in it's not the only one. There actually in this mountain range, there are like like 16 uh temples. Um wow. not all of it are Hindu temples, some of it are Buddhist temples, but a lot of it are Hindu temples. So it it does exist. There's definitely more than one, but it I don't think all Hindu temples are. Like some are actually like built from the ground up <laughs> so what, in places not next to mountains and cliffs. Um, wow, a mountain range of temples is a very cool idea. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing is like in this, um, the like Alora Caves, yeah, there are apparently like, yeah, like 16 temples. Like I, you, you could spend like a month <laughs> like just exploring all the temples um, in this one area. So yeah, one of the cool things is you see like a lot of these like freestanding columns that shoot up um and uh, like again they and then they have sculptures of like the god that's carved like on top of them and like around them as well and like it's basically hindu art and architecture is very complex like if anyone's like ever seen um a hindu sculpture they're often they have like multiple heads and multiple limbs and you can view it view it from like 360 degrees there's like a face or um a figure like on every side so it's it's almost like there's no space in this temple that wasn't used to like depict something, whether it's like a god or there's actually like panels that have scenes from like the scripture that I mentioned earlier, um, like on some of the temple walls. So it's hard to try to think of how to describe this for someone who's not looking at it right now, because it's like, okay, like it's a temple and it's carved out of rock and it's like very clear, but it's so interesting because it's so different than like if you just told me to imagine a, a stone temple, right? Like, I can do that. And this doesn't not look like that, but there's also something about it. Like, it's so clear that this was just carved out of the stone here. Like, there's a lot of it, even though it's, like, very detailed work and very beautiful work, there is something about it that's still a bit rough. That's still a bit like, oh, you can, when you say, like, oh, this was just carved out of the rock here, they're like, yeah, that makes sense. It doesn't look unnaturally smooth like there's something about it that still looks quite natural um which it, it almost creates this illusion in your mind of that like this just naturally formed out <laughs> of this cliff face here which is such a cool effect and also i don't know if i'm just like nature starved because i live in chicago <laughs> yeah. even seeing this picture where it's like carved out of this mountain range and you can see like the lush green in the background and i'm like oh my god God, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's not even about the art. That's just about trees. But yeah, <laughs> oh, well, exactly. It's like a, a lot of times architecture and nature, you know, are seen as like basically opposite things because there's the outside and there's the inside. But this one, like it, it integrates so well with the surrounding landscape. Really, like it's really cool. And and yeah, yeah, actually, one of the reasons why like this temple is really famous and also like a UNESCO site is that um, apparently it is like one of the mo most well preserved uh, Hindu temples, as in like almost all the sculptures that were originally there are still there. And then there are apparently also paintings on the inside, although I couldn't really find any pictures. Um, but uh, but apparently, yeah, like the paintings are also really well preserved, um, unlike a lot of other temples where the paintings would have just like faded away. Hey, you love to see some good preservation of things that are thousands of years old. For sure. And yeah, like last thing I'll say about the temple is that um so i did learn that there's uh the temple like it kind of there's like a main like arcade and uh area there and then there's like um i guess like an entry and then it does go like deeper and deeper there's like layers and layers of chambers and it goes um all the way to this inner sanctum uh which is which has a sculpture or multiple sculptures of the god Shiva uh, in this particular case. Um, but apparently, so only the 
uh, members of the highest caste in Hindu, uh, sorry, in Hinduism, which are the priestly caste, are technically allowed to go in the inner sanctum. So I'm actually not sure if we go there if we would be allowed into the inner sanctum oh i'm but, sure not no. yeah so like so uh, yeah exactly like um it would be cool to see but you know it is a very uh, important religious ritual um for hindus i have some examples of sculptures and um mostly of the gods um there's again there are so many different Hindu art, like from so many different places, um, but I'm probably gonna only gonna show um, maybe about like four or five pieces of sculptures that are depicting some of the most famous gods in Hinduism. As I mentioned before, the uh, Brahma is known as like the one true god or the the original creator um, is what he's known as, um, but it is. Uh, he, like he is a part of a trinity of gods, which is called the Trimurti, and that com- that's composed of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And I'll talk about what Vishnu and Shiva represent when we see some of their uh, works later on. But basically, Brahma is known as the creator, Vishnu is the preserver, and Shiva is the destroyer. Um, so that's like they kind of make up the world is like created and then it's preserved, but then there's also destruction. So there's like these opposing forces um, that these gods represent. And um, usually Brahma, so you can tell that a sculpture is Brahma because he's usually depicted with four sides. So if you see um, a Hindu sculpture with four faces, now there's other characteristics, but it's quite likely it's Brahma. This particular sculpture, uh, they actually believe was probably in the outer wall of a temple that was dedicated to Shiva or Vishnu. But for some reason, Brahma became a side character, (laughs) like in those situations. It kind of feels like a little acknowledgement of like, Okay, yeah, like this is a temple to somebody else. But like, you're also very important. So like, here's your statue. (laughs) Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, there is Brahma, and then Vishnu um, is known as the god who represents preservation in the universe. Um, So, uh, and again, he's like one of the highest Hindu deities. I guess his role is to maintain order in the world. So apparently when like negative forces threaten the order, he descends onto the earth in this form to like overcome the negative force. Oh my God, where is he? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if that's sacrilegious. Like, no, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, it's like we really could use Vishnu in the world. <laughs> like, um, But I think I can see like this is why I can understand maybe more people pray to Vishnu because <laughs> he is kind of, no, I don't want to say more useful because it's like the creator is like, okay, the world's already created. It's already here. We don't need like the day-to-day maintenance kind of, you know. Yeah. So the way you can tell uh, the sculpture is Vishnu is that um, he's usually depicted with a conch, which he apparently uses to like blows on it to alert troops to a war. Um, he often holds a club, uh, a mace and a discus. Um, so basically a lot of weaponry i presume it's to fight the negative forces um and in this particular uh sculpture that i showed you he's actually also depicted with his two wives um lakshmi and sarasvati um so and again we don't really have too much time to get into them but they are also goddesses that are worshipped in hinduism cool and he apparently so this is the thing is Brahma transforms into or becomes like Vishnu in certain circumstances, but then Vishnu also can take different forms. So apparently sometimes he is like a man lion. So if you see um, a a figure that's depicted, I guess, as half man, half lion, that could also be Vishnu, but not in this particular case. Uh, The next one I have uh, is the, like I mentioned before, is the deity uh, Shiva, which is what the temple we talked about earlier was dedicated to. So Shiva represents destructive force in the universe. So the opposite of creation and also the opposite of maintenance. Um, Basically, apparently Shiva's role is to destroy things 
whose time has come to be destroyed. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah. So, and this is because, um, uh, so Hinduism have this belief which is um, called uh, samsara, which is the cycle of death and rebirth. So, like Hindus, they don't see life and death as like a linear progression. They more so see it as a cycle. So I guess in a way, I, I believe this means like being destroyed. It doesn't, it doesn't have like the similar, the same representation or the same connotation as what we think of as like destruction and everything's over. Like it's more like, it's more like going into the next like phase of the cycle. That's a really nice interpretation. That feels, that's a lot less. I've heard this from, some people and i think it, it it's probably traces back to hinduism and this idea is like the idea of a, the apocalypse and defining that not as the end of the world but sort of like a rebirth of the world and a transition into like a new age or a new whatever it is um which sounds like it's very much rooted perhaps in uh this idea in hinduism exactly and and apparently it's the reason why like shiva sometimes is um takes on the form of apparently like more phallic shaped or sometimes a more like vaginal formed because like it's also supposed to represent um like yeah this like rebirth um so like death also leads to rebirth so that's that's nice that's why yeah the other thing that's interesting about shiva is that um if you go to a hindu temple um quite often the sculpture is placed on southern walls of the temples because apparently the sanskrit characters for shiva um, also has a secondary meaning which means south facing so that's another way you can tell if the sculpture is shiva because if you it's on the south face um and it has these other characteristics um oh sorry i didn't mention so shiva so like is known as he's quite often carrying uh, a trident uh which um I guess, represents the destruction. So if you see a figure with a trident and if you see it on the south wall, it's probably Shiva. Oh, okay. But the other thing about Shiva, though, uh, there's, um, an, I guess, another form or another interpretation of um, what Shiva represents. Um, so I just sent you a link to another sculpture. So this one is a copper alloy sculpture. And it apparently represents Shiva as Lord of the Dance. So apparently Shiva um, is also known as a Lord of Yoga. Cool. Yeah. So, um, so, but so, and apparently, so the uh, mostly it's ta- Tamil sculptures of the Chola dynasty. Um, often, like they tend to depict Shiva as this like dancer. A- again, it's it's interesting how like Shiva is like represents destruction, but there's also this. I guess, like, fun dancing side of Shiva. I guess this ties into, like, the dual sides of, like, destruction, but also restoration and, like, the sort of cyclical nature of things, because it feels like it falls into that. I find yoga very restorative, so (laughs) I I see it. (laughs) This is actually one of the Hindu gods that I've known a little bit about before, because I've seen, I've seen this sculpture, like, in... I'm assuming like maybe like in businesses that like that's like owned by like someone uh, who is Hindu because I've seen the sculpture placed as I presume, you know, for like good luck or something um, like in people's homes or in their businesses. So this is the Hindu deity Ganesha. Apparently, he is the god that is the remover of obstacles. Basically, he kind of symbolizes that he'll help you to achieve success. So I can kind of understand why like a lot of people would put it like in their place of business because they want like success (laughs) in their work. So Ganesha is usually represented as like uh, as a figure that has an elephant head. Yeah, everybody loves elephants. <laughs> exactly. So and I'll talk about kind of why because like, uh, these other gods all have like humanoid faces, even though some of them have like four faces, like or multiple limbs. Um, but this is uh, an example of a major Hindu god that does not have a human face. So yeah, he's often depicted with a battle axe, a lotus, um, a bowl of like uh, sweets um, and a broken tusk, like a broken elephant tusk. And apparently that is representing like a, a story in the uh, in one of the like epics of Hinduism. 
The reason why he has an elephant um, head is because he is the son of one of the Hindu uh, goddesses, uh, Parvati, uh, who is the wife of Shiva. And she apparently wanted a child. And I'm assuming Shiva didn't because uh, Parvati basically just like had a Ganesha herself. Like she just gave birth uh, to Ganesha nice. without the assistance of Shiva, which is it's like good work. Impressive. <laughs> yeah, very impressive. Um, but then Shiva, um, I guess, was confused about who it is. And so he beheaded Ganesha. But then he was like, oh, no. Oh, this like this is uh, Parvati's son. Sorry. So he replaced his head with an elephant head. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, so that is how he got the elephant head. <laughs> that really reminds me of stuff from, like, Greek mythology kind of stories. Because uh, that just that's, it just seems like the kind of stuff that's happening in Greek mythology a lot, too. Where, you know, babies are being born single-handedly. And then also sometimes <laughs> they swap limbs sometimes. Like, just, just kind of the vibe. And it's like, okay, I mean, they're gods, I guess. They, you know, they don't abide by our laws. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, exactly. They managed to survive without a head and then got another head from an elephant. And now he has a really cool elephant head and he has the power to make you successful if you prioritize him, which I can understand. Listen, if I accidentally got beheaded, um, I would also make it part of my thing that people needed to prioritize me before I do them any favors. I maybe would have trust <laughs> issues. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, um, and then the other thing I uh, learned about is that elephants apparently in, like, Indian culture um, also are, have been associated with fertility. Um, so possibly somebody could pray to Ganesha for the success of being able to have children. <laughs> hey, that makes sense, too, because he was born, like, divinely as well. So, you know, I feel like it all that all works out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, in addition to uh, some of the other gods that I talked about, um, especially the very important ones like um, Shiva and Vishnu and Brahma, um, there is also a god called the goddess, but the goddess is another one of these gods that can take on different for different forms. So sometimes they are the god uh, Devi, sometimes it's Durga. And so this particular uh, sculpture that I'm uh, showing you right now is a sandstone sculpture uh, from India. And this one is um, uh, depicting Durga killing the buffalo demon. Cool. I mean, I assume. I assume this is positive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so I think so. The goddess uh, Durga represents like the warrior goddess. So that's qu why quite often when she's depicted, um, she's like killing something because <laughs> she's the warrior. Nice. Uh, so uh, yeah, apparently, so because of this representation as the warrior god, um, so the goddess represents an energizing force in the universe that causes action to occur. So, so like, again, she's all, she's quite often um, in some sort of active form, um, again, in this case, killing a buffalo demon. <laughs> um, and, but like, she could be, sometimes she's accompanied by a lion and she's like struggling with the demon, like while she's like fighting it. Very often there's, there's a battle and there's something like crazy going on <laughs> in in sculptures depicting uh Durga wow that's considering that I feel like pretty much everything else we looked at has just been the god kind of posed and just kind of sitting or standing there um it's really interesting to see this action shot sculpture of like no this person is in motion <laughs> yeah so I like I presume she's or or uh she's worshipped maybe for people to have like motivation for like things to happen like she's like it seems like she gets things done <laughs> so maybe someone wants to really accomplish something active when you need to really kill a buffalo that's that could be one of the things <laughs> um so <clears throat> yeah apparently there's also a uh festival a six-day festival uh in india called the durga puja which is a six-day continuous celebration of durga as well oh that's nice 
I basically kind of showed you like a bunch of different sculptures that's like made at the so the Shiva sculpture was from like 1300 to 1400 and then um the Durga sculpture is from 900 so like they're they're from again they're from like a lot of different times and uh, different places in Southeast Asia. You know, I, I didn't really get into kind of like the carving styles of a lot of these because, again, like there is no like one defining style of Hindu sculptures, but some of the con- the consistent motifs are these uh, different ways that these gods are represented. And um, and the and what is interesting is that like these, uh, so a lot of these sculptures are would have been a part of these Hindu temples. Um, so the ones I'm showing you are uh, from the mostly from the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, which I have been to. I believe I've actually seen some of these in person, but I just could can't remember which ones. Um, but th- like when you see these sculptures, you are uh, in the context of a museum, you are seeing it out of the context of the temple. Um, and they are quite often supposed to work in conjunction like with everything else that is in the temple. Um, but again, it still gives us like an insight into, um, you know, how they were depicted over the centuries. Yeah, I can definitely see how these works of art would be more impactful in their original setting and in their original meaning. I mean, it's interesting because like if you haven't been looking at them alongside us, like they are all literally like taken out of walls. So like the background, the back of every single one of pretty much everything that we've looked at today, like has been like flat stone because it's literally something that was carved into a wall. Um, And so, yeah, you can definitely tell that there's, context missing from it which is a shame but this has been a very interesting rundown of like sort of these major motifs and the way that these major deities are depicted in art because like as you said how can you even begin to try to like express the major themes from hinduism which is like even considering the some of the other religions we've talked about like unbelievably old and covers so much of It covers so much ground, um, but this has been a really cool way to check out just a couple highlights. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's been really fun, like, uh, also for me to just, like, um, yeah, learn about a lot of things and about Hinduism that I uh, didn't know before. And um, I think in the future, hopefully I'll be able to tell what gods, Hindu gods, um, it is that I'm looking at just based on, you know, what they're holding in their hands. Um, Again, my research, I, I... like I looked at a whole bunch of different um, gods as well, but again, there are just like hundreds, so we don't have time to talk about them all. Um, but it is that's what makes it so fascinating. There's just so much to learn. Yeah, now we have a challenge. So we've gone through sort of like these major markers of how these gods are depicted, and so next time you go to a museum, you go to the Hindu art section, and then you say, okay, like let's see how many of these I can name. And then you check the label to compare and see if you got it right. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good exercise. (laughs) That's what I'm going to be doing. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Pictorial. And if you have been here for the last four episodes, our whole little mini mini series about religious art will be back to our regularly scheduled modernist abstract ridiculousness soon. (laughs) (laughs) Most likely. You could find our show notes at relay.fm slash pictorial, or you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at pictorial pod. And if you'd like, you'd also follow me on Instagram at aspiring robot FM. And you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram at Articulations V. I'm also on YouTube as Articulations. And speaking of YouTube, we also have a Uh, YouTube channel, Pictorial Podcast, where you can see video versions of our episodes and look at the art as we uh, as we go along. Um, Most recently, there have been a episode on net.art, which showcase some stuff that actually we didn't talk about in the episode. So I encourage everyone to check out the video versions as well. Yeah, that one's really cool. We're catching up on the on the back catalog with the video ones. And there's all sorts of fun stuff in those. So Thanks for listening, art enthusiasts.